Bert Delisle is here down from Edmonton. He used to be one of our members. I guess he sort of is still a member. And he was in the area, so he thought he'd uh, put on a little demonstration doing a uh, camera. <coughs> no. And the floor is yours, Bert. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I hope you guys don't mind. I'm going to record this. I've got my camera set up, and I'm going to record it. So uh, we could probably turn the uh, overhead on if you want. Because I've got a couple of slides to show. What, what I've been doing when I was uh, last time I was here in Calgary, uh, we came down. Uh, a bunch of us from Calgary came down in 2019. I looked at the Christmas ornament I brought down at that time, and it was uh, a little Christmas tree ornament. And I handed a few of those out. And I think that year I made 35 of those. Every year my list has gotten bigger and bigger. Is that on? Yeah. It's on. Okay. And uh, every year I've been making a different ornament, and uh, uh, the list has grown and grown and grown. Last year I made uh, threaded acorn boxes, and I ended up uh, giving away 86 of them. So this year I'm uh, doing, uh, what I'm doing this year is a, a little candle ornament. But You're see. giving those away, did you say? Uh, well, I, I have been, uh, on, the, on the ones that I've been... Uh, just give me a second here, I'll get into here. So uh, when I was still living here in Calgary, I was making these kind of ornaments for one year. They were really simple. They were uh, just a little bowl with a, uh, a snowman. Then I started making these. These are uh, three, four, five pieces. They're uh, split turning, so they were fun. They're, uh, uh, they belong to a set of uh, nativity set. And then when in 2019, the last time I was here in person, uh, this is the Christmas ornaments that I was making for that year. And uh, I had to look it up on the, the bottom to find out when that was. It was 2019. Since then, I've, uh, in the following year, I made uh, snowmen. And uh, snowmen by themselves are kind of bland, so I like making small pieces. So I made it a caroling snowman with a little candle. And I think I had to make 45 of those. Then the following year, I made a, a little bell. And it's got a clapper in it. And uh, it's one, two, three, five pieces. To, to put that thing together. And I think I made 55 or 60 of those. Last year is 2022. These are threaded acorns. So the bottom body threads into the acorn top. I ended up making 86 of them. And you could put any one of the bodies into any one of the tops. By the time I made 85 thread sets, I knew how to make threads. <laughs> <laughs> I got my yeah, I got my 10,000 hours in, and uh, so this year uh, I decided to make something different. I was looking around for ideas, and uh, somebody mentioned something about a, a crystal candle, and I thought, well, I don't make crystal, so I looked around and I uh, had a couple of different ideas, and I seen one, but it had a metal uh, metal base and a metal handle, and I thought, ah, wood turner, we'll make it all out of wood. So that's what we're going to show you how I make tonight. Uh, I think they're a lot of fun. I have to date, I've made 98 of them. Yeah. Do you offer 200? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about 200, but that's in my office right now. I think there's 85 of them sitting on there. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, it looks like a lot of work, and some people have commented, well, that's production work. That's production work. I didn't make all of these at one time. I would go out in the shop and spend 35, 40 minutes and make half a dozen. And then I'd go spend two hours and make 40. Because the time it takes to make a few, you'll find that tonight, I'll probably make three or four. For the time it takes to make one, you can make two or three or four. And when you go to the shop and you have an hour to kill, it's just a great way to do it. Okay. So these are all for your grandkids, Bert? I wish, yeah. Well, my, my friends and family group has grown considerably <laughs> over the last, last five years especially. And uh, I've got some of these. I think I've given away 15 already. It's early in the year, but I've... I've given away 15 already. I've got three of them on the table here. You can add them to your uh, your uh, your draw at the end of the year. And then the ones that I make tonight, you can also keep those and put them in your draw. Has your wife left again? Oh, uh, she's uh, she works. She had her uh, uh, quilt filled yesterday at the quilt shop, so she's happy for the next week. You must be down in the shop quite often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so we'll get out of that. And we'll get back to uh, back to here. So, 
So I don't know about, you guys can give me some feedback on which angle is going to be the best, but we'll start with uh, making the, uh, the candle. And so starting with the candle, uh, I didn't bring a drill with me, so one of the things I found when I first started making these, I'd uh, turn them on the lathe, get it down to a candle, and then I'd drill them on the lathe. And you've got to stop and do that, that takes a lot of time. And I'm cutting these anyhow, so I took them over to my drill press and I drilled a, a little hole in somewhere in the end. And it's not critical where the hole is, because once you're turning it, you can make that part of the candle. Okay? And again, I, uh, lots of times uh, you'd want to find center on a piece of wood. But for this project, this piece of wood is bigger than what the candle is going to be. And the more practice you get at just putting it on center and kind of guessing, the closer you get to being on center all the time. And which way does this go? Forward or back? Yep. Forward? Forward. The other way, forward. Okay. The other forward, yeah, that'll work. So one of the things that I found is that it's easier to have the little hole on this end because you, you taper it down and then you part off. And if you've got the hole on the other end, sometimes you have to go around the shop to find it. And it's just a little tiny piece of wood, so it's, you don't waste a lot of wood. And I use a, a step center, a half inch step center on here. And uh, for two reasons, because it gives me a, a size reference, it's half inch, and I take the candle down to about half inch. And uh, because it's a step center, it's spring loaded. So you'll see, I, I'm gonna turn this one, and then I don't even have to turn the lathe off to do the next one, because it's a step center. As soon as it comes away from the drives, it stops. Uh, face shield, I didn't bring my face shield. Is there a face shield I can use? I get one. Oh, thanks, Terry. For that, I got a list. I got a list of stuff. How long in the... is that? Pardon? How long is that chunk of wood? Uh, three, inches? three inches. Okay. Roughly. Uh, let's see if I have put it on here. I can say it's. Uh, I didn't even write the dimensions down. The dimensions aren't that critical. If you uh, yeah. um, if you look on my site, uh, Bert Delisle on YouTube. I posted this process on there here a couple of weeks ago because I, I got a real good memory. It's really, really short. And so this morning I watched my own video to remember how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so if, yeah, if you look up Bert Delisle on, uh, on YouTube, you'll, you'll find the reference to it, along with a bunch of other ones. Tool of choice for doing these is a skew. I brought a spindle gouge for doing a little bit of the work, a skew and a bowl gouge, and a barney tool, and a uh, tenoning tool. So this particular tool I use for putting the tenon in, and it's great because you can put a tenon in even if the tailstock's in place, but you'll see that when we get to that point. I made, I made my list with all the parts and everything that I needed to do, and I had my uh, smock and my uh, face shield sitting on the bench and I lowered everything in the box and walked out and plucked my face shield and smock on the, on the table. Anyway, I usually run these pretty fast when, we, when I turn them. That's about 3,000 miles a It's a long tool rest, so I might have to, if I make a few catches because I'm too far away, I guess uh, that's what live demonstrations are all about.
love you and you're free to do this because you can cut both ways. And it gives you a lot of free practice on getting uh, the angles right. And it also lets you know when your tools are getting dull because it's, uh, if the tools are sharp, when you're done with the screw on the candle body, you don't even need to sand it. If you touch it with sand paper, you screw it up. There's the cap. And the cap are easy to recover because the frame doesn't have to be that big. Center is uh, you can set it on the point and it doesn't drive the wood until you put some pressure on it. So it's between the two points, so it's not going there, but when it goes, it's spinning. So when I was doing 25 or 30 at a time, I could just come down through without stopping. Some people think that well, you should stop the lathe every time you uh, do some work, but if you get comfortable with your equipment and you know the risk and you understand what you're doing, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as you're using the step center, I've, ne I've never tried and do that with a, a, a spur drive. You would always do it with a face drive or a step center. And I like the step center better than the face drive because the uh, spring action on the step center just seems to be a little better. The, uh, I don't know if they use a, a heavier spring or whatever, but uh, the step center spring has been really good. And I've had this step center for uh, probably 10 years, and it's working just as well today as the day I got it. So my layers, I've got a zip mark, so I usually run it at max around 2,000, just because they're one of the top and city 34. Because it's such a small piece of wood, and I'm using a screw, I learned from a fellow in the audience a long time ago that uh, when you're doing small pieces of wood and a sharp screw, it turns out. Isn't that right, Gary? So there's the second one. Uh, I've got three blanks here, and I can use the third one as well for the time it takes. I love using the screw, and I've got to thank Terry for, uh, for introducing me to uh, wood turning way back when. And um, we also used to have Richard Rockin come up here to a Terry shop and I did a couple of workshops with, uh, with Richard and uh, between the two of them and the pointers they gave me on using the screws, it's all about confidence, you just, you just do it. And when I make these small projects, you often get a lot of practice. But these catches on here are real easy to recover because I had to check early, so that means that uh, I'm going to take it down a little smaller. Nobody will know that I have to check, except for the people that are watching this video.
Can you zoom in a little bit? Oh, I think I've got this thing telephoned as far as it'll go on this. I don't have a, I don't have a remote zoom. So this one here is, uh, this one here I could zoom in a, a little bit. How's that? Shift it a little. Shift it a little bit. Which way? This way. This way. Okay. Okay. So the next thing I would do with the candles just to get. Get them done. Uh, knockout bar. I brought one. I hope my knockout bar is long enough. Oh no! Is there a knockout bar for this lathe? It's on the end of. It's in a rack on the end. On the end here. Okay. So this is just a piece of plywood with a piece of sandpaper on it, and uh, I usually run this around 6-800 RPM, and I just flatten the bottom of these off because they need a nice flat. perfectly parallel and it had a little platform and I found out that uh, you can do it by eye good enough to get it flat enough to glue and when it's hanging on a tree nobody will even notice it. <laughs> base. So on this one I like to use a, a little bigger step step drive but I don't uh, <laughs> I don't change this one on the fly. I just use the bigger step drive because it gives me a little bit more driving surface on this on this block. And again I used to worry about uh, trying to get the uh, tool rest is a little bit long but I used to worry about trying to get it on perfect center, but I found out that uh, as long as I'm somewhere as close, it doesn't really matter. But this is roughly uh, two inches, uh, two inches square, or partially square. It doesn't really matter. And spin this so it doesn't uh, hit the tool rack. And I take it with a bowl gouge, and uh, can we see that? Oh, I should be able to. And, uh, does, it, does that interfere having the angle in the dust? Don't, don't bother with that thing now. Don't bother with that one? No. Okay. So here again, it's, uh, it's a small piece of wood. So I usually turn it up around 2500. And I just take it around. I don't know really too much about it. I just, just want to get it round, that's all. And again, now I'm going to be missing about uh, 2,500. So that's that's the round done. 
there down to round. Step is we'll take these rounds and we'll uh, make the candle bases. So I, I use a stronghold chuck with two inch jaws, standard jaws, and it uh, just nicely fits these rounds. And I don't worry about uh, trying to fit it on uh, on the outside edge or on, on a tenon. I just push it right in against the back. And then what I do is we'll face this off and put a tenon in and in a recess rather. I'll put it, I'll face it off, put a recess and around the corner. And I'll face it off with a bowl gouge. Or I could use a spindle gouge. So the beauty of this tool is it, it's uh, ground on an angle. I just took another uh, scraper that I had, and it's ground on an angle such that this cutting edge, when it goes into the wood, even if the tailstock is in place here, you still have room to get a, a pretty reasonable tenon on here, a recess. You just push it in. This uh, tool rest is a little bit more. So this is basically just a scraper, so you go in the center and just lift up, bring it to the side, cut the end, and then I use it around to round it over a little bit, get rid of this dark corner. And at this point I would uh, I would sand it, and this would be uh, the, the bottom of this handle. Basically, is uh, I would even put some friction polish on here and call it this part of it would be uh, would be finished. Then we take this little block of wood, which has been finished on one side, and you just flip it around and do the same thing. And so we get two bases out of one little block of wood. And this has got a bit of damage on the corners here, but it doesn't matter because we're going to take those corners off. And if there's a little damage on here, it can be a little smaller and it won't matter. So I'll just back this up a bit and see if I can do both from the same, from the same elevation. It makes a nice enough shine that uh, you don't have to knock yourself out with uh, sanding. Everybody loves sanding. OK, 
Okay, so there's that part finished. This one might fly off the lathe when I do the other one, but we'll, we'll find out. And this one should be okay. Okay, so let's do the let's do the skinny one first. You can't have a demonstration without something going wrong, so. Yeah, this one's not going to work. So uh, it's not it's not the end of the world with a small piece of wood. When I did the demos the uh, practice demonstration that I videoed in my shop, I did the same thing and uh, it just broke out. And the beauty of it is, is each one of these bases will make two. So if you lose one, it doesn't really matter. Or if you screw up on one, it doesn't doesn't matter. So now what we do is we fire that up. And we take a thin parting tool and we kind of guess where our center is. Give yourselves a little bit of relief here. Uh, this is walnut. This particular one's walnut. This one here is, uh, I'm not exactly sure what kind of wood this is, but this one makes a real pretty, uh, pretty base too. So, and the wood. candles? The candles maple. And I'm going to make some out of uh, yellow cedar. I just recently got some really, really dry yellow cedar, three inches wide and three quarters of an inch thick. So I'm going to try some out of yellow cedar and see what that does. It might give the, might give the candle a yellow appearance, but I haven't got to the point where I'm going to airbrush, but I was going to airbrush some of the candle flames to uh, yellow. And then I realized that uh, you really don't need it. And I'll place this one off again. Of a recess in there in order to hold it up in the uh, 
Take a glass. So it's got that one. It's got a nice recess on both sides, so it's, this one should work well with the uh, smaller chuck. So because I'm turning on a recess and there's a very, very limited amount of uh, wood here to hold it, I have to be gentle when I'm uh, tightening it because if you tighten it too far, it'll just break out and uh, then you start over again. But it's, uh, it's a small piece of wood, so it's, it's not the end of the world if you, if you lose one. Hey, Bert. Yep. What about sanding at this stage? Say what? You have more wood available for you for sanding. It's not in the jaws. I know you sanded it before, but you could sand at this stage. Uh, I could, uh, but it's hard to sand this part. It's easy to sand this part in the jaws. You can sand the outside. Once I part it off, I can finish sanding the, the edge as well. Like the sanding. But to get the, the inside of here sanded and the flat on the bottom, I can sand that on the other chuck. And then when I flip it around, both sides are sanded. So the only sanding I need to do is this little half inch piece in the middle. And I can do that now when I do each half. As I part them off, then I can uh, thin them up. So again, I just face off, face off the center so it's flat, maybe a little bit concave. And because this is a cross ring, you can go guys and hollow it out. And it doesn't take much hollow. If you go too deep here, you'll turn into the recess. Don't ask me how I know that. And I think everybody has to do it once or twice in order to fully appreciate how thin it would be. So that's good to do. And your, your question there now, Kai, 
I have access to all the parts that haven't been sanded. I can go in almost up to the jaws and sand the outside, sand the inside. I always break the edge off the outside because when you uh, come in with a, a bolt out, the edge of this little uh, cup that can be really, really sharp. So that's as simple as it takes to make the bases. And so we've got one, two, this will be the third one. I've got three candles, so I might as well make three bases for the time it takes. person could go to uh, 300, 400, you can go as high as you like. Uh, I am not um, I'm used to, to do it. Why is the button in the center? Pardon? Why do you take the button down in the center? Uh, I take the button down in the center so it's flat and slightly concave. And that's for to help us when we're gluing it up. And uh, the flat portion of it should be roughly half an inch or roughly the same size as the base of the candle, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. It, it, as long as it's somewhere as close, it's gonna be all right. Because when we make the next piece is the, uh, the little ring, the little handle portion. I can see why you make a bunch of them at the same time. Yes. You don't yeah. have to change as much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, I, when I was doing the, the batch that I had the picture of in my office, there was 80, 85 on there. I think I turned uh, 75 candles in about two hours. Yeah. And then the next day I went out and I made 75 bases, which is only 35 pieces, right? Because you, you do two out of what? And then you had lunch. Yeah, and then I had lunch, yeah. <laughs> and so then we go to make the, uh, the, the rings to get a block of wood. Uh, this is uh, probably almost an inch across, maybe an inch and a quarter there, but it only has to be about three quarters of an inch. And so again, again, I don't worry about the uh, finding exact center. I just get it fairly close because the wood's bigger than I need. So as long as I've got it somewhere is in the center, close enough in the center, I'll have enough wood left to uh, make the uh, make the part. Okay, so that's a. Uh, I use a little oil to skew. And we'll take this to round.
that's turned around. It's got a little bit of a tendon on it. Talon chuck with the number one jaws. And I set that in there up against the shoulder. And then I bring this up just to, to make sure it's centered. And then I tighten this up. That's nice and centered. Take this out and put the uh, drill chuck in. And again, the uh, size of the hole on here doesn't really, <coughs> it isn't really critical as long as it's smaller than the diameter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this particular bit is, uh, I think it's just one size smaller than uh, than half inch. It just happened to be what was in my in my hand at the time. And we'll slow this down. And Okay, usually I run this around 700 or 800 RPM. Hopefully we got enough power on the high belt speed here that we'll do it should with this belt. And we'll run this in. Now if I was doing this at home, I'd run the bit. But because No glory. Pick it up and see a little bit. And then we'll just clean up and make sure that this is nice and round and smooth.
And so when I'm making these, like I say, I'll have a stick like this, and I would make rings all the way to the end, so instead of uh, an hour, I can have a whole pile of these rings made. And the reason I started making these in, uh, in September is because, like I said, I, needed, I knew I needed to make about 100, and I wasn't sure how long it was going to take, so I started early. And it just became so much fun, I just kept on doing it. It was just a blast. So the next step, I think, is uh, basically it's blue up time. Hopefully we can see what's going on here. One, two, three. You see those? I found a, a glue that works really, really good for this particular uh, application. It's called uh, Tight Bond Quick and Thick. It dries perfectly clear. It uh, sets up uh, relatively quickly. You can get to a, a point where it's uh, kind of tacky right away. So it only hold, you only have to hold it on here for uh, 20 or 30 seconds. And it looks like a lot of white glue oozing out there, but it dries clear. And uh, once it's clear, if I had a piece of paper towel here, I could wipe off the excess. But I found that even with that amount of glue sticking out there, when it dries clear and you spray it with lacquer, it looks like the wax is exactly. It looks like the wax has dripped down the candle. So I, d I, I don't worry about it anymore. So that's what I like about making uh, these kind of ornaments is to try and find a way that's quick and easy, and yet and it's fun to do. And this quick and thick, I just discovered it here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I really like it because it's. It, I know they say the glue is not supposed to take up any. Uh, uh, gaps but quick and thick was designed for working with moldings and sometimes with little miters where you don't have an absolutely perfect fit and the uh, quick and thick glue will actually fill the void a little bit and it dries clear and it's paintable and uh, we're not worried about structure so uh, we'll just let these sit here for a while and they'll, they'll set up a little bit and what we'll do now is uh, Finished the uh, little discs. The little discs are uh, not completely flat on either side, and they don't have to be perfectly flat. But the, it's nice if they're a little bit flatter. And then to get a good glue surface, I end up putting a, a flat on one side of the radius. These things are a godsend for hanging on to small parts because your skin isn't very thick and if you're working on the sanding disc you find out just how thin your skin really is. They say it's nice to be thick skin but there's a limit. So you just set this on here and just gently touch it, flattens that side off, grab it with the forceps again. And whenever I'm working on the lathe and forceps, I never put my fingers in the holes. Right? It's just I grab it on the outside. I've never had it uh, grab or fall out of my hands or go away on me, but uh, I don't want it to either. So now normally I'll take a look at the, uh, the ring, and sometimes the drill is a little bit off center. So it's a little thinner on this side than it is on that side. So when I want to put the flat on it, I'm going to put the flat on the... Uh, on the thick side. Whoops, can somebody grab that for me so I don't uh, pull my cables up? It's right on top. If that had been my fingers, I would have ended up driving my fingers into the, uh, into the sander. So I'll grab it again a little bit tighter. And I put a little flat on it. And the reason I put a little flat on it is because I'm never sure if this radius 
is going to match up perfectly with this radius, but with a little flat on there, it doesn't really matter. Right? So we'll grab the next one and we'll do the same thing. And I see this is the finicky part, is uh, trying to do this because you don't want to burn your fingers. And here I said I, put, I don't put my fingers in there and I go ahead and do it. I'll just flatten that off. Turn it around. And just flatten the side off. Then I take a look and see if this one here is almost perfectly centered. So I'm just going to touch it on one side. It's got a little flat. I'm going to do the third one here. And this one looks like it drills off just a little bit, so I'll pick the, uh, pick the fattest side and I'll flatten it off on the flattest side. So that's got that. Now we go back to our quick and thick. And by this time, these have already set up enough. You can pick them up and you could probably even drop them and they won't fall apart. And then again, we put a little, little quick and thick on there. It's a little bit on the bottom. And we'll set this on. I try and line these up with the uh, with the hole so that when they're hanging on the tree, the string is going to hold it in uh, hold it in a little bit more ba balance. Here and this doesn't take very much glue. It doesn't take hardly any at all. Well, that's enough to go on there. And go on there, so where is the holes? Right. Hold these on there for 10 or 15 seconds. The quick and thick seems to grab it pretty quick. And having a little flat on the, uh, on the ring goes up against the flat of the candle. And then the radius of the bottom of the ring, it follows the, the radius of the bottom of the uh, candle holder and you end up with a candle. Now the next thing that was on the list was the candle brought in some ribbon along with me. Anyway, the point I was going to make with, uh, with the ribbon was uh, using forceps to, uh, to tie. When you put a real, I got real clumsy fingers, so when I put the ribbon through or the string through there and try and tie a knot, it's a pain in, pain in the butt. So I'd bring the ribbon up together, pinch it with the forceps, and then twist it around and use the forceps to push it through the loop, grab it, and then you can tighten the knot. But uh, I thought I'd brought some tie wraps with me, but apparently, apparently I didn't. Either that or I just can't see them. Go figure. So I use this really, really fine ribbon. Come on. And uh, see how clumsy I am. Sometimes I'd lose my head if my hat wasn't on it. Well, what's that? 
this will be the longest part? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, isn't that the, the hilarious part? Is the turning the turning part's quickest? Trying to thread a needle is uh, the longest part. But when I first started tying these, I was tying them by hand, and it was the longest part. It, it just got so frustrating trying to figure out how to tie a bloody knot, as clumsy as I am. So what I found out was going like this. You grab the ends of that with the. Let's see which way this way. Okay with the, um, the tongs here, you make a loop and then you put the forceps through the loop and when it's through the loop you can grab it real easily with your fingers and the, the knot's halfway down to the candle but you just work it, you end up grabbing the end of the loop and just work the knot back up and pull it tight and then you've got a nice little hanger and it's that simple. Uh, I'm not sure how long that took me to make these three, but uh, like you can see with the process, if you spent the same amount of time doing candles, you'd have a bunch of candles, and this another hour you'd have a bunch of bases. And the way I looked at it, it's fun. If you go out with a skew and you've got to get your muscles in tune anyhow, and you take a stick and you just get at it with a skew, if it blows up four or five of them, who cares? After you get into the groove, you, just, you can crank these candles out so quickly and you find out when your skew is dull after you've made like 10 or 12 all of a sudden you realize it's not cutting the same your skew is dull so you go sharpen it and then you find out how sharp it is i learned more about how to use a skew doing these bloody candles than i did in the last 10 years yeah. just because you're doing so many and as soon as something changes you notice it right away and if you change wood it's completely different if you do it from hard maple and i did one with yellow cedar and yellow cedar cuts like butter touched it with a skew and I cut the damn thing in half because it cuts so easy. <laughs> but it's fun, you know, the, the whole thing should be. It should be a fun exercise, and especially for Christmas ornaments. You're making them for friends and family, people you love, so you, you put a little bit of love back into them and uh, it's fun, it's just, it should be fun. If it's not fun, we wouldn't do it. Any questions? I must say that's one of the nicest presentations I've watched in a long time. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank it's you. Very good. Yeah. And hopefully at the camera angles and stuff where I've only got two and I've recorded this for my own purposes too. I'm going to post it on my own site, but uh, uh, I've only got two cameras and I appreciate your comments about zooming in and stuff because I I'm try to make it so I can get the best angles that I can close as I can. But I, I don't get hung up on trying to zoom things because I'm not electronically technical. I, I, I set it up and it should just work. It's not, it's not needed. It's all it's, the same. It, yeah. as, as long as it's close it enough so that you can see the action. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, good. Well, that's great. Well, thank you kindly. Thank you. For thank you. And all of these will go in your uh, uh, for your draw if you want to. These ones I'll have to sign by hand. Those ones I lasered. Yeah. How many coats of wire did you put on this? I usually put uh, I usually put four coats of lacquer. I use rattle can lacquer, and so uh, the, I had uh, I had 50 of them on a table, and I used a whole can of lacquer. So how many coats? I don't know. I just kept going until the can was empty, and I had 50 ornaments that were done. You know, I hang I hang them on a rack and. And then just spray them, and then when they dry, go back, spray them again. With 50 ornaments, I just sprayed until the can of lacquer was gone. <laughs>